Okay. It may seem like I'm coming on uh, 35 minutes late this morning. But I thought I came on 35 minutes ago. And I did my whole thing. Boy, what you missed. I was great. I, I for the first time, I, I danced, okay? I actually uh, uh, did a little dance over here. And we've got, I'm, I'm sorry, we've got uh, four uh, dancing dogs, okay? Uh, they're, they're poodles, we, a friend of ours. And we had that on there. And they balanced a, a, a ball on their nose and played um, uh, sort of like dog basketball. It was great. We had a little orchestra over here. And we thought we were on. And uh, not only that, but I talked about the Knights Templar and Friday the 13th. And I read an awesome section from, uh, and it, as it turns out, I didn't have the camera turned on. And when I turned, when I ended the video, it was actually, I was starting the video. So, and now somebody's calling me. Oh, gee. Hi, hi, Patricia. I got to warn you that that you're you're live on Facebook at the moment. <laughs> Hello, everyone. How about you give me a call when you are no longer on Facebook? <laughs> okay, okay. I'll be I'll be through in about a half an hour. Okay, great, Lon. All bye. Right. Bye, bye. I hope we're still on. Because <laughs> it says in live video, so I think we're still on. It's Friday the 13th. My message must have been too too heavy. Anyway, uh, Friday the 13th is sort of a special uh, or a, a notable day in the history of the Knights Templar. And uh, with uh, the, the tragedy uh, unfolding uh, in the, quote, Holy Land right now, and because all of it and all of the tragedies, the nonstop tra tragedies of the last uh, uh, 2,000 years in that uh, uh, particular region or for... 1500 years anyway, uh, really had their genesis in the, the, the events leading up to including the Crusades and the madness of the occupation and, and uh, the feudal crown heads of the divine right of kings of European uh, uh, monarchs and all of that, in a sense, at least uh, were uh directly or indirectly uh concerned with the historical events that were taking place uh about the about that time okay so anyway i'm going to i'm going to read a section i'm going to reread a section it should just roll off my tongue i've i just practiced it uh and it's from my book, The Key to Solomon's Key, Is This the Lost Symbol of Freemasonry? And uh, there's a chapter, of course, called the, the Knights Templar. And if I can find it again, I will share it with you. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see. Okay, uh, here it is. I found it. And, you know, I can't, I had this little light on here so I could, I could read it better. And I don't want to stick it in your face. So I think I'll just do this.
This is a crazy day. The eclipse is tomorrow. What's going on? On Christmas Day, in the year 1118 CE, Christian era, a group of nine French knights, including Hugh de Payne, cousin of the Comte de Champagne, and husband of Catherine St. Clair of Roslyn, stood before the Patriarch of Jerusalem. That's like a mini-pope. Okay, it wasn't the pope, it was the, the Patriarch of Jerusalem. It was like a mini-pope of the occupied Jerusalem, occupied by uh, temporarily by the the uh, temporarily victorious Christian crusaders. And they set up their own king there in occupied Palestine. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll start again. On Christmas Day, 1118 CE, a group of nine French knights, including Hugh de Payne, cousin of the Comte de Champagne, and cousin of Catherine de St. Clair of Roslyn, stood before the Patriarch of Jerusalem and King Baldwin II of Palestine and vowed themselves to poverty, chastity, and obedience. They said they wished to form a holy order of warriors and requested that they be given as their headquarters the area adjacent to the eastern sector of the king's palace in Jerusalem. A place we know today is the Temple Mount. For reasons that no historic historian can properly explain, the patriarch immediately accepted their vows and the king summarily surrendered the area to the knights. And you can imagine, it's the prime real estate of the navel of the universe. Oh yeah, you can have it, you nine guys. This area of Mount Moria had a rich, legendary past that reached deep into Semitic mythology. It was said that an exposed boulder at the summit of the mount first issued at the dawn of time from the mouth of the mythical serpent Tahum and would serve as a portal connecting the upper world and the infernal regions. It is also where the tradition, where traditions inform us that Abraham built an altar of stones upon which he prepared his son Isaac for sacrifice. From that altar, Jacob, the son of Isaac, took the stone to be his pillow as he slept and dreamed of a ladder reaching to heaven. Upon awakening from his vision, Jacob anointed the stone with oil, and it supposedly sank into the ground to form the foundations of what be, would be the three great Jewish temples. The temple of Sol, uh, King Solomon's temple, which supposedly was uh, 959 BC, and then a, a larger but less ornate second temple in 535 BC. And finally, uh, and that was supposedly built by the children of Israel upon their return from their captivity in Babylon. And the third temple was the magnificent third temple, or which has been called the third temple, uh, in 20 BCE, built by Herod the Great and destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Herod's temple was the largest of all of them. It was the temple that stood during Jesus' lifetime, where the second chapter of the book of John tells us he was taken as a child, and same place where he scourged the money changers. The knights called themselves Pauvre Chevalier du Temple, poor knights of the temple, or Knights Templar. And it appears they traveled to Jerusalem for the singular purpose of establishing the order 
and securing the Temple Mount as their headquarters. They expressed their official raison d'etre uh, was to protect the increasing number of Christian pilgrims that were uh, traveling the dangerous roads to the newly conquered Holy Land. But that job was already being handled by lots of Knights of St. John. Now, these are nine new French Knights coming in. So we want to protect those people. But they're already being protected by an army of other Knights. Okay, It's very weird. It's highly unlikely, however, that this was their true intention, um, at least not at first. In fact, it's doubtful that the nine pauvre chevaliers du Temple did any soldiering at all for nine years, during which time it appears they kept to themselves and remained at the site of the Temple Mount, just ordering out for pizza. I just threw that in. Modern Templar buffs speculate this tiny group of knights were engaged in an aggressive excavation of the ruins of the Temple Mount, searching for the Ark of the Covenant or King Solomon's gold or other priceless relics. Much as many of us would like to have solid archaeological evidence to support these speculations, there appears to be none. Nevertheless, it's hard to imagine that nine men billeted for nine years in the closed confines of the most legendary and mystical spot on earth would eventually want to have a look around. What, if anything in particular, they might have been looking for, we can only guess. But conspiracy enthusiastic, enthusiasts and modern novelists certainly think they found something or learned something. Something very important. Something that in a few short years drew to them the goodwill and deference of the Church of Rome and the princes of Europe. The story of the Templars' meteoric rise to power is unique in the history of Western civilization. And it's the subject of many well-researched and well-documented uh, books and essays. Still, it's frequently hard to separate fact from legend. But curiously, for our purposes, legend is as important and relevant as fact. For religious and political movements are shaped by what people believe to be true rather than what may actually be factual. I implore the reader to keep this fact firmly in mind as we delve deeper into this subject. For nine years after their formation, the Pauvre Chevalier du Temple initiated no new members and remained doing something at the temple site. Pizza box were filled to the flying buttresses. Then, in 1126, two of them, Hugh de Payne and André de Montbard, returned to France to confer with Montbard's nephew, the abbot of Clairvaux. The abbot was no ordinary churchman. He was a senior advisor to Pope Honorus II and the most brilliant and charismatic fig figure in 12th century Christendom. We know him today as St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Whatever it was he learned from his uncle Andre, Bernard immediately threw his undiluted energies and influence behind the Templars. He convinced the Pope to give the Pope Chevalier du Temple full church recognition, not just local Jerusalem mini-Pope, the Pope-Pope. And St. Bernard volunteered to create the order's constitution, which he wrote up. But oddly enough, the rule of order that Bernard composed contained absolutely no reference to protecting pilgrims. What it did do 
was unite the two most powerful forces in the Western world, the Church of Rome and the ruthless brutality of the feudal warrior. The Knights Templar were to become the first truly disciplined army since the Ro Roman legionnaires, fighting men who lived like monks, Christian soldiers whose bloody occupation did not jeopardize their prospects of going to heaven because they had a license to kill evil. Unlike other knights who owed allegiance to a specific king, duke, baron, or nobleman, the Templars were to be holy warriors answerable only to the Pope. They were not, however, to be the papal army. Indeed, from the very beginning of their existence and for the next 200 years, popes treated the Knights Templar as if they were too hot to handle. They were allowed freedoms and privileges enjoyed by no other body in Christendom. They had their own priests and confessors. They were allowed to build their own uniquely styled churches. They were freed from countless other papal restrictions and supervisions. Europe's nobles, noble families soon began to lavish gifts of land and money upon the new order, and their privileged sons raced each other to join the pauvre Chevalier de Temple. In eleven twenty eight, before returning to Jerusalem, Hugh de Payen, a relative by marriage to the St. Clairs of Roslyn, Roslyn Chapel uh, fame, traveled to Scotland and paid a visit to his in-laws. The St. Clairs were obviously impressed with what they learned from de Payen and immediately granted, and you uh, Scots in the audience here can help me with the pronunciation, they immediately turned over a tract of land uh, known at the time as Balan Tradoc, which is now the town of Temple, to be their headquarters in Scotland. Almost overnight, a new class of citizen was introduced into the feudal system of the world, a new kind of man a free man. Unencumbered by the restrictions of church and state, a free man who needed no pass from bishop or king or baron or lord or magistrate to move as he will on the face of the earth. This freedom of movement is one of the privileges of the modern Freemason as well. And it's echoed in the Masonic ritual when asked, what induced you to become a Mason? Your first answer is that I might travel in foreign countries. After the Crusades, the Templars' international structure and organizational skills turned them into a super economic entity, a world army, a country without borders because they could skirt church laws that forbade the borrowing and lending of money with interest, they set to work to become the world's first international multinational mega bank. They invented checking. They maintained an army of fierce and highly trained soldiers and a fleet of sailing ships. Kings borrowed money from them. And even though they were technically answerable to papal authority, for 200 years, popes let them do whatever they wanted. It was as if the Templars, as movie gangsters would say, had something on the church. And they had something on the monarchs of Europe. Some speculate they even had something on the Saracens. Were the Templars blackmailing the world, or were they simply a dynamic idea whose time had come? If they did have something, that, what could it possibly have been? 
What could they have unearthed in that legendary spot where heaven and hell are said to touch the earth? What secret could Hugh de Payne and André de Montbarge have shared with the future St. Bernard and the St. Clair family that could have been so earth-shaking as to reward the Templars with a blank check from the masters of their world? Was this object, this piece of information, this treasure destroyed with them? Was it lost? These questions have been the subject of speculation for 700 years. In the last few years, several best-selling books have theorized the treasure might be lost gospels or something related to Jesus and the early history of the church. Perhaps documents or artifacts proving that Jesus had a twin brother or that he was married or and had children. Some believe the Templars found the Holy Grail or the Ark of the Covenant, or the mummified head of John the Baptist, or even the demonstrably unresurrected body of Jesus Christ. Others more recently have even speculated that they found the gold tablets of Moroni that would eventually find their way to the New World to be discovered by Joseph Smith. the Mormon prophet. A popular motion picture suggests it was even a good old-fashioned treasure of ancient artifacts, gold and silver. Whatever the nature of the secret, speculation that it was not lost with the seemingly complete destruction of the temple is fueled to a white heat when we learned that as the tide turned on Wednesday, October 11th, 1307, just two days prior to the universal arrest of the Templars, a fleet of Templar ships quietly slipped from the harbor at La Rochelle and were never seen again. French Masonic historians make no secret of their destination, Scotland. The mystery of what, if anything, the Templars found has driven men mad for nearly a thousand years, and I'm not exaggerating. For some individuals, the Templar myth has become an all-consuming and unhealthy uh, obsession, and their wild, paranoid public conjectures continues to bring unfair scorn and ridicule on the efforts of legitimate scholars and researchers. Speaking through one of his characters, and this is one of my favorite authors, Umberto Eco, uh, speaking through one of his characters in the novel Foucault's Pendulum, Umberto Eco makes the following all too true observation. For him, everything proves everything. The lunatic is all ID fixe, and whatever he comes across in his lunacy, you can tell him by the liberties he takes with common sense, by his flashes of inspiration, and by the fact that sooner or later he brings up the Templar. I realize that by writing this book, I too am running the risk of putting myself in the above category. But run the risk I must, because whether or not their secret treasure was real or imaginary, whether or not their connection to Freemasonry is historic or merely traditional, where magic and masonry and Solomon's key is concerned, excuse me, are concerned, the Templars do indeed have everything to do with everything else. Again, I apologize for my first false start and false completion. 
which caused me to start a half hour late. Anyway, happy Friday the 13th, Knights Templar, if that's an appropriate thing to say. And the book is The Key to Solomon's Key. Uh, is this the lost secret of masonry by Lon Milo Duquette? And it introduced, by the way, by my good late friend, James Wasserman. Anyway, that's it for today. We'll see you tomorrow. Continue to be good to yourself. Be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. And we'll see you tomorrow. And if I'm right on time, there might be an eclipse going on. Unless that's a false start, too. <laughs>